Shalom Aleichem. My name is Tony Pino, and today we are continuing in our series concerning the overview of the book of Acts. Today, we are looking at chapter 25. And as usual, we're doing our best to keep it within its historical context, the culture, the language, and the historical setting there. And so when we find these biblical truths that the author is trying to convey, we know that that can transcend into any generation because truth is truth when it comes to Yah's word. Amen. So last time together, we left off with Shaul Paul being in custody okay, of the Roman commander there, Felix, in the area of Caesarea. He's going to be there for about two years before there's going to be an exchange of power from Felix to Porcirius um, Festus is going to come over and take over. And so this is going to run us right around 60 to 62 CE. So we're closing in on the destruction of the temple here soon and the end of Shaul's life. So he spent many years preaching the gospel at this time. Amen. The Judean leaders want to have him put to death because they believe he's not preaching Torah or keeping Torah. He's preaching a false Messiah and he's telling people to forsake the law of Moshe, even though he's already told them once and showed people that he isn't. But they want to go ahead and have him put to death. Amen. So they're willing to lie and, and uh, set up an ambush and all these other things. Um, it just shows you how corrupt at this time the priesthood really is, amen, and the Sanhedrin. All right, let's go ahead and go to Acts 25. All right, so here we are in Acts 25, starting with verse 1. Three days after Festus arrived in the Providence, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. There, the ruling Kohanim and the leading Judeans brought charges against Paul, basically the high-ranking lawyers all right, within the Sanhedrin. They were urging him, asking a favor to have Paul sent to Jerusalem, planning an ambush to kill him on the road. So these guys here are the ones that don't follow Torah. They don't follow the law of Moshe, just like Yeshua said they didn't. Okay, because they're planning an ambush to kill a man without trial. All right, so in verse four, Festus then answered that Paul was being guarded at Caesarea and that he himself was about to go there shortly. So then he said, let the prominent men among you go down with me. And if there is any wrong in the man, let them accuse him. All right, after spending more than eight days, eight to 10 days with them, he went down to Caesarea. The next day, he sat on the judgment seat and ordered Paul to be brought in. When he arrived, the Judeans who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing against him many serious charges, which they could not prove. All right? Serious charges according to their law. So they were willing to lie, okay, uh, trying to convict Shaul, Paul, of following a false Messiah, of not teaching the people to do the Torah anymore, to abandon the law of Moshe. All these serious charges they could not prove. So now we got Paul giving his defense. It says, Paul said in his defense, I have committed no offense against the Torah of the Jewish people or against the temple or against Caesar. All right, so Shaul is teaching both Jew and Gentile to keep the Torah. If he was not teaching them, he would be lying here. He would be the one deceiving people because the Torah was a light to all nations. So if you are a Gentile who lived among the Jews, right, became connected to their, what, covenants, you became a believer in Yeshua, who is a Jewish Messiah, you would be taught the Torah, just like we saw in Acts 15, if they were to go to the synagogue every Shabbat to hear the law of Moshe. Remember, those are the only scriptures at this time. Those are the only commands and laws that Yeshua followed and that he taught people to follow, all right? He showed them the deeper meaning of the Torah, okay? And so, yes, Shaul is not contradicting the words of Yeshua. He is teaching Jew and Gentile to keep Torah, that it is a must that they keep Torah, okay? And so also against the temple, this means the animal offerings. This means the system there. He is obeying the system according to the Torah, okay? Not probably necessarily according to oral law, but according to the Torah, they will not be able to prove that he is violating any type of temple laws, okay? And then against Caesar. Well, the Roman law of that day allowed the Jews to worship their God, okay? As long as they didn't do anything against Rome, 
all right, caused some type of rebellion or tried to resist them or anything, they had permission from Rome to worship Yahweh in the way the law of Moshe told them to worship. Um, and so he didn't violate Caesar's commands either in that sense. Okay, let's move on. Verse nine, but Festus wanting to do the Jewish leaders a favor said to Paul, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem to be tried before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Judeans, as you uh, very well know. All right? Again, he's reiterating, I haven't violated the Torah. This includes the fact that he is preaching a true Messiah and that he's teaching both Jew and Gentile to keep the Torah. Okay? If he's not doing that, he's lying. So what is often happening in Paul's letters is people are misunderstanding Paul's letters when they think he's teaching the Gentiles they don't have to keep the Torah. This right here tells you that you are misunderstanding the words of Paul in his letters. Okay? He is teaching people to keep Torah. All right, let's go on. If then I am in the wrong and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges, no one can turn me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. All right. So he's laying it out. If you can prove these charges, hey, I'm, I'll die. You can put me to death. But if you can't, I want to appeal to Caesar. All right. Verse 12. Then when Festus had consulted with the council, he responded, you have appealed to Caesar. To, to, so to Caesar, you shall go. Now, after several days have passed, King Agrippa and Bernice, all right, King Agrippa, this is King Agrippa II, the son of King Agrippa I, and the great-grandson of Herod, great Herod, okay? Bernice is his sister, and she was considered like a queen, um, and she had her own area of ruling there, so this is brother and sister, arrived at Caesarea to pay their respect to Festus. While they were staying there several days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man left behind as a prisoner by Felix. When I was in Jerusalem, the ruling Kohanim and elders of the Judeans brought charges against him, asking for a judgment against him. I answered them that it is not Roman practice to turn over anyone before the accused meetings his accusers face to face and has an opportunity to make his defense concerning the charges. So when they came together here, I did not delay, but on the next day sat on the judgment seat and ordered the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they were not bringing a charge of what crimes I suspected. Instead, they had certain issues with him about their own religion and about a certain Yeshua who had died, whom Paul claimed to be alive. See, verse 19 tells you they're trying to say he doesn't teach the Torah anymore. He violates the law of Moshe and he's teaching about this false messiah. And of course, they can't prove that. And Paul is not doing that. Verse 20, since I was at a loss as to how to investigate these matters, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem to be tried there in regard to them. But when Paul appealed to be held in custody for the decision of his majesty, the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pageantry. They entered the audience hall with the commanders and most prominent men of the city that at the order of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said to King Agrippa and all present with us, you see this man about whole, whom the whole Judean population petitioned me. All right, this is an exaggeration. Okay, this is a synecdoche here. It was mainly the Judean leaders. All right. Both in Jerusalem here, showing out that he ought not live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving of death. And when he himself appealed to his majesty, the emperor, I decided to send him. Yet I have nothing specific to write to my lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the investigation has taken place, I might have something to write. For it seems illogical to me when sending a prisoner not to report also the charges against him, all right? So they're in this big situation now. They can't find formal charges really to charge Paul, all right? But they've taken away two years of his life, holding him in custody. So this is very serious. They are trying very hard, but of course the Kohanim are very deceitful at this time. They are very corrupt, willing to violate the Torah in order to ambush him and put him to death, willing to lie. 
okay? And so this concludes chapter 25. We have the very confession again for the second time that Paul is teaching people to keep the Torah and to follow Yeshua as their one and only savior. So it's salvation by grace. And after you receive the grace and you're in the kingdom, you now do the Torah. All right. Torah is for kingdom living. Amen. And so next time together, we will do chapter 26. And so until we meet again, everyone, shalom.